All right, today in our Circuits 101 series, we are going to be introduced to capacitors. So capacitors are something you will see everywhere and they can be used in a lot of different ways. But first, I'm gonna talk about the more simple way that they're used in DC circuits, jump into the AC way that circuits are used, kind of provide what for me is a good analogy of how they work, and then we will jump into how they're most commonly used in a circuit with two circuit examples here, some practical examples. So we'll jump into that at the end. But first, let's talk about capacitors. Capacitors are simply two plates held very closely together, and then they act kind of as electrical storage. And the interesting thing is that these capacitors and in DC act as an open. You can put a DC voltage over and no current will pass whatsoever. So very briefly, I'd just like to say when you are doing a DC analysis, you can look at a capacitor and just say, oh, I can pull that out. I don't even need to worry about that. Anything in series with that capacitor, you can take it out. There's no current flowing through it. It won't have any effect on the voltage in a DC circuit. And so it actually simplifies the circuit quite a bit by sometimes removing, removing big swaths of the circuit so you don't even have to analyze them. And that's on the DC side. And I'm not even going to do a circuit example for that because it's so simple. In a DC analysis, if you see a capacitor, that and anything in series with it can just get rid of and you are done. Now with AC, capacitors and circuits can act a little bit strange. And that is because their impedance, their resistance changes depending on the frequency and the capacitance of the capacitor. And that is something we will get into and also think about the different ramifications of that. The impedance of capacitors can actually be modeled with the equation or the number one over J omega C. And so the J is simply an imaginary term since I in electrical engineering is current, we use J instead of I like mathematicians and other people do. So that J is simply an imaginary term and that will affect phase shift and um, the leading and the lagging and all that sort of stuff that we aren't going to worry about in this tutorial, even though on the practical example, you will see an example of it. But just right now, know that that has something to do with the phase, the power factor, all that stuff that we will get into more when we are doing AC circuit analysis. The omega is simply the frequency of the AC circuit. And if you remember, omega is simply two pi F or the frequency. So omega is just, yes, two pi F. There we go. And then C obviously is the capacitance. And so you can actually model, and when you're doing AC analysis, you can model a capacitor with that one over J omega C. Now, if we just take that and we look at it and we see omega, remembering that that's um, directly linearly related to frequency, let's take a DC value, zero, and put it in there. And then we see no matter how big or how small the capacitor is, that impedance is going to be infinity because it's one over J times zero times the capacitance. So you can see right there from the mathematical equation that, oh, it makes sense that at DC, impedance is infinity. And of course, math always describes reality, not reality come describing math or something like that. That's kind of a pet peeve of mine. But that is a great way to think of it intuitively. If you ever forget, like, wait, what? how does this act? Just remember, 1 over J omega C, and if omega is very small or zero, then your impedance is going to be incredibly high. And on the inverse, if that omega is very high, then no matter how big the capacitance is or whatever, then your impedance is going to be very, very small. And of course they're interrelated and it's that middle area where things get muddied and things get a little bit more complicated. But you can look at it at, with, with the extremes of DC, you basically have impedance of infinity. Infinite frequency, whatever that would be, would mean zero impedance. And then it's just in the middle that you get this sliding scale that you have to calculate to get more precise measurements. So I've talked a little bit about how capacitors work with DC and AC and how they can block DC and pass through AC. But let's just think a little bit more about what it is, going back to that idea of it's simply two plates very, very close to each other. Now what is happening, you can consider it this way, and there is gonna be some argument and some people that may disagree with me, but this works as a metaphor or an analogy and uh, we won't worry about the physics of it because I think this works fairly well. 
But with those plates very, very close together, if you have a positive voltage and a negative voltage, then you're going to get a lot of electrons on one side of the plate and a lot of positive charge or a lack of electrons on the other side of the plate. And they're kind of attracting each other and they want to go past, but there's a gap between them that they literally cannot jump. But with this negative plate collecting the electrons, you can almost think of it as a bucket. So if you have a circuit and it's going along and you have a bucket, it can store that charge for you. So this is a very interesting thing because you'll hear leading and lagging sometimes in AC circuits with capacitors and inductors. And they'll say that capacitors have a leading current. So capacitive circuits lead with their current. And for the longest time, I just, I couldn't remember and I'd have to either rote memorize it and hope that it stayed in my brain long enough for a test or, um, or just look it up every single time. But finally, the way that it finally clicked for me that I'm like, oh yes, this makes sense is using water as an analogy. So imagine you unhook the hose from the end and suddenly the water starts rushing out, but there's actually still pressure in there at first as the water starts rushing out because it's still being squeezed in the bucket and squeezing the hose and the current goes out and it isn't until the current flows for a bit that the pressure starts to drop or the voltage starts to drop and the voltage drops after the current is going to drop. So that is the best way to think of it is that the voltage moves after the current because you have that bucket that what is literally just a plate that collects electrons in our analogy is a bucket that can collects charge. And so the water flows in, fills the bucket and then comes up to pressure. And then once it flows out, the water flows out and then the pressure drops. So the voltage is behind the current, meaning that a capacitive circuit, the current leads the voltage. And that's one of the reasons why it's confusing because you'll hear that in a capacitive circuit, it is a leading and you have to remember that that's in reference to the current. The current leads the voltage. And so hopefully that analogy makes it a little bit more clear and will help you understand that why in a capacitive circuit, you have the current first and then the voltage first going in and then going out. So that's an analogy of how it leads, uh, how the current leads the voltage. But we can discuss very briefly how a capacitor actually works and why it doesn't let things pass through in DC, but why it lets things pass through with AC. And it's interesting because there's been a lot of talk on this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a lot of research into this and there were some people who I generally very much agreed with, but didn't in this case, and that's totally fine. I came up with a way that I'm not sure if it's correct in a physics standpoint, but it makes sense to me and it makes sense to my understanding of how electricity works. So if it works for you, great. If not, well, I'm sure you'll let me know. The way I think of a capacitor is there's like a diaphragm in the middle. And when you have current flowing, it kind of pushes and it pushes that diaphragm to the side, but it doesn't actually move anywhere. You don't get any flow. It's just kind of like trying to push, but if you are to take that and pull that away and then push from this side, that diaphragm moves the other way. And then if you go back and forth, back and forth, even though no fluid is passing through that diaphragm, it's wiggling back and forth and you're transferring power. And so that's what I think it, with this, you're not necessarily literally moving electrons from one side of the capacitor to the other side, even though from a quantum mechanics point of view, that totally can happen. I think what happens is that you get the current flowing one way and you get that pressure pushing one way and transferring that power through that diaphragm. And then it goes back the other way in an AC circuit and pushes it back. And so that's the way I visualize it in my mind is basically you have something pushing one way and then you reverse the voltage and it pushes the other way and it's back and forth, back and forth. And even though no electrons are passing through, you are still getting that transfer of power from one side to the other. Again, a physicist may walk in here and smack me around, but it makes sense. And as far as I can tell, it works for understanding how all of this works. Okay, so let's talk about two configurations that are most common with a capacitor. And the first way is called either blocking coupling or AC coupling. 
And basically, this is when you have a capacitor in series with a load, and then it blocks the DC, which is where it gets the blocking, or it couples the AC, which is where you can say, all right, I'm not totally connecting these two, two circuits, I'm only coupling the AC portion of it. Because once you put that capacitor in series with it, it will stop all of the DC current, but it'll pass the AC current. So that's one of the configurations. The second way that you use a capacitor is called bypassing, shunt, or decoupling capacitors. And that is when you put the capacitor in parallel with your load. And basically that means it will take an AC signal and shunt it away from your load because if you have an AC signal, it will want to drop through the capacitor versus going through your load. And it decouples things because it can remove the AC signal that would instead be going to your load it will be shunted to ground. So that's something that I think is best illustrated by showing a couple of circuit diagrams and showing how it acts in real life. So with that, I am going to do the first one first, the AC coupling, and going to show how as you increase your frequency, you will get more signal passed through. And then I will go over and check out the decoupling or the shunt configuration. And we'll jump over to the oscilloscope right now and do that. So let's start with the blocking or coupling or AC coupling circuit. So here we start with a capacitor in series with a resistor. And as you can see, the signal has to flow through the capacitor and then through the resistor to ground. Now on my oscilloscope, you can see I have a yellow line and that is basically the input to the capacitor. And then my blue is actually my voltage over the resistor or over the load. And at the moment, you can tell that my frequency is about 10 kilohertz, which is close enough to DC that you can only see the faintest of wiggles there. Note that right now my divisions are both at one volt, so this is the same scale right here. When we are doing other things, we may not be able to see it. We may need to change the scale. But here we are with a practically DC circuit, and we are not getting much through the capacitor. But let's immediately jump this from 10 kilohertz up to 100 kilohertz. All right, and already you can see a little bit more wiggle there. Just it's passing a little bit, not a ton, but you're getting a little bit. But we will probably see a much bigger jump because we're moving faster from 100 kilohertz up to one megahertz. So as we go up, oh, you're seeing those blue lines. That is getting more defined in the peak to peak voltage is changing and getting much, much bigger. So we are now at one megahertz, and you can tell that obviously we are getting, oh, what is that, about a quarter, maybe a little bit less of the voltage being passed through. But as we go from one megahertz up to 10 megahertz, we see it, now it's about half. So as we continue up, you will see that this gets closer and closer to passing the entirety of the signal. So we are now at 100 megahertz, and those are almost the exact same. So right now at 100 megahertz, we're basically treating this capacitor as a closed. It's a, a short circuit. But also when I was talking about the phase shift and the leading and the lagging, you are seeing that now because you are seeing they're not directly lined up. And that is again because the capacitor is charging and discharging as we oscillate between positive and negative, and that is causing a lag in the response. And so this is very, very important in AC circuits. And one of the main things you do is calculate the phase shift from the peak of one to the next. And that is something that we will get into quite a bit in our circuits two series tutorials, but we aren't going to get into right now. One last thing I'd like to go over while discussing the block blocking or coupling or AC coupling is right now I don't have any DC offset. So let's take this offset and you'll see the input shifting and you'll see the output staying basically the same. So my input is now offset by two volts DC, but my output has remained completely unchanged. I'm just having trigger troubles today. And if I shift down the other way, I will once again mess up my trigger, but show how the output remains unchanged. And again, that is exactly what you would expect with this blocking, where we block the DC and AC coupling, where we allow the AC to go through. All right, so let's now move on to the next one. Okay, for the bypassing shunt or decoupling capacitor, 
what I have set up is instead of just your load with the capacitor in series with it, I set up a capacitor in series with another much smaller resistor in parallel with the load resistor. So in this case, we have that 100 ohm resistor that is simply there to make it so we don't get too much current through the capacitor and burn it out. But that is all it's doing is to limit that a little bit and many many times you don't want that resistor because you want as much current to flow through that capacitor as possible. Now I have it set up so it's basically the same. Here we are measuring the input into the load and then I'm measuring with the blue the voltage over that 100 ohm bypass uh, resistors just so that we can measure to see how much is going through there. And again, we're looking at about one megahertz and we're not seeing too much going through this resistor. But as we go up, we'll notice something interesting that even though I have a waveform generator, it won't be able to produce enough current to maintain this two volt peak to peak. So what will be happening is as I am increasing the frequency, enough current will be shunted through this 100 ohm resistor and this capacitor to cause the overall voltage to decrease. And so we'll basically see this in action. So right now we're at one megahertz. Let's bump it up to 10 megahertz. And it so far seems to be doing pretty well. But then once we jump it up to 20, still doing all right. Now we're starting to see things get weird and it can no longer produce the current. Now at 60 megahertz, jump up to 70 and it, it's dropping a huge amount. So let's change the scale a little bit here. So I'm gonna jump that up to 200 millivolts per division instead of two, and then change our scale this direction. So you can still see that it looks pretty clean, but it has served its purpose of making it so that any current that would normally be going through the, or any high frequency or voltage surges that would normally go through the load are now going through this bypassing or shunt capacitor. And that is why you will see capacitors placed right next to the power supply on ICs and things like that. Because one, it's not only helping when there is a voltage drop, but if there's a voltage spike, that will go through and get shunted through the capacitor to ground versus going into the load itself. Okay, so that is an example of the bypassing shunt or decoupling capacitor. And we originally did the blocking or coupling or AC coupling capacitor circuit. And that is it. That's all we need to worry about. You've learned how in a DC circuit, you can just remove the capacitor. You don't even need to worry about it. Hopefully gave you a couple of ideas on how a capacitor works physically and mm, it's just some visualization. So it's a little bit more intuitive for you. And hopefully the blocking and the shunting and the AC coupling, all that stuff makes a lot more sense since we did the physical real example. If this was helpful, please give this video a like, subscribe to our channel, and we will see you in the next one. Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. Did you know that circuitbread.com has more than tutorials? One of the other many things that we have are several excellent open source textbooks that benefit from our search tools, highlighting, super fast page changes, and keyboard friendly navigation. Go check them out.